Well, she's dad. <laughs> I, I do represent uh, Senate District 20, which is West Kowalpin. And prior to becoming a chair of the Agriculture Environment Committee, I was the chair of, well, last year it was Water Land Agriculture. And then before that, it was seven years as the chair of the Energy Environment Committee. And what Vincent is saying is, is absolutely correct in that uh, I'm a former high school English teacher, so don't ask me how I got into politics. But uh, <laughs> what I've learned is that it's, it's really all about relationships and that you, you know, get along with people and that you are respectful of the ones, the people that you don't agree with on various issues. You're still respectful. You, should, you still show that aloha. And I think uh, ultimately when bills that are, we have over 3,000 bills, roughly 3,000, slightly over, introduced every single session. Our session starts mid-January, ends first week in May. And of those bills, <coughs> approximately 200 or 250 actually pass into law. And so in that four month period, uh, as you work towards trying to get bills, good bills passed uh, that help people, particularly in the agricultural realm that I'm in now, uh, it's important, as Vincent mentioned, it's a Kako thing for you folks from the main, and Kako means all of us, inclusive, inclusive, not you, us, and them, it's us working together. And I want to refer back to what uh, Vincent said earlier about how important it is coming down to the square building and testifying on these various bills, sure, it's important, you know, we get a, a petition that's got 5,000 names on it for, for whatever. Yeah, that's important. But when we hear from, numbers are important, make no mistake about it, right? But what's even more important that i found uh, since I got elected in 2006 to the, uh, the state legislature is when people come and tell their stories, when uh, uh, Kimo Simpliciano or Steve Sakala, or you guys, excuse me, come down and actually tell your story. When Bobby Bahia comes, I want him to tell his story about transitioning from being a conventional farmer to regenerative farming. I want him to tell his story how, when I went to a site visit when he, last year when you guys were showing me the, the trials that you were doing with the IMOs and everything. And so here's this guy, here's this Hawaiian guy, and the thing that stuck out that I remember vividly what he said was, and he, he alluded to it today, was it's very important to me what I pass on to my kids and my grandkids. And I don't want to pass on to them that I was poisoning the soil. I want to pass on to them that you take care of the Aina, the Aina takes care of you. That's what I want to pass on to. But it's that kind of testimony. I visited James, uh, I've been visiting farms the last couple of days on Maui, and I went all day yesterday in Lanai. And I was out there in, in, in James's field, and, and feeling the passion of James talking about his issue, looking at his moringa and, and the ulu that he's planted there, and telling the stories about how he's restoring some of the ulu with Shit, I'm not a farmer, but he's explaining to me about layering, hair layering or something, getting some of the bark from the old ulu, the, the breadfruit trees that King Kamehameha used to plant, right? And now they're, I mean, this is, a, this is the stuff that I know in being at the legislature, when we hear those stories, that's the most important thing. That trumps position papers, PowerPoints, everything else, because you're dealing with something with real, Real stuff, families, passion, stuff that you guys are doing. So, um, yeah. so speaking to the hemp legislation, so speak to think the future of that. The future of the hemp, you know, one of the things that, as I mentioned this morning uh, on SB 770, we're waiting for the governor to sign that. Um, one of the things that did not pass was setting up a special fund. So as we're in transition, waiting for the administrative rules to be approved, as I mentioned this morning by July 1st, when the 2016 legislation passed, Act 228, for example, uh, it's in statute, if you decide to farm hemp, you're gonna pay a $250 annual fee for your license, plus $2 per acre, right? And then you're also gonna pay $35 for inspector to come around and check the THC content of your hemp plants. You've got to pay for his mileage. You got so that's all part of the bill. 
So what we felt was very important was, why don't we have this thing become self-sustaining, take those fees that are paid by the farmers, put it into a special fund, and turn that around and spend that, keep that in that fund for him. Didn't pass. So uh, some of the money committee chairs have an aversion to special funds. Um, they like to be able to move that money around and put it into the general fund for whatever other projects. So um, as far as the future, that, that will come up again this next session. I will continue to try to set up that fund uh, specifically for um, the monies that are coming into the uh, from, from hemp will, will, uh, will stay in that special fund. And that's pretty much, uh, you know, I work with uh, Vincent and the uh, Hawaii Farmers Union on uh, Senate Bill 356, which would have set, uh, set up a farmer's apprentice mentoring program. I'm a very uh, strong supporter of regenerative farming and uh, Korean natural farms. I got it going in my backyard, and I got turned on to, uh, I went out to David Wong's 20 acres of, of Korean natural farming out in Waianae. I was blown away. Yes, especially I walked up and he's got this piggery and there was no smell. It was the weirdest thing I had <laughs> walking around. And so he just started laughing. And then he showed me his, his moringa plants. He showed me his, his, his ulu, his bread, everything. And, I, and it was just, and as he explained it, he started going into the IMOs. And so he helped us set up our little thing in the backyard. You know? So uh, I uh, that did not pass this year as far as, and this was when I, I visited Bobby Pahia's farm last year. There were a group of about 10 or 15 farmers that were being mentored by Vincent, Bobby Pahia, some of the established farmers. So how else are our young people going to learn how to farm? Learn from the experts. That's these guys, right? And so one of the main concerns I have as the Ag Chair is average age of farmers in Hawaii, 61, right? I resemble that remark. <laughs> And we, this was mentioned earlier today. How do you attract young people, right? How do you inspire them to uh, get them interested into what Ginger John was talking about so they can understand the spiritual relationship of farming, right? And that's one of the things I'm working on, uh, continue to work on with uh, some folks who are putting together some ads, some uh, doing some digital marketing stuff but uh, hopefully, hopefully that's going to be rolled out in the, in the near future. Senator Cameron, could you please speak to also, what do you think the governor, I know a lot of people are pointing to the governor blocking, and uh, I don't get that from him. I don't really feel like he's, because I heard from Scott Enright that, you know, when he talked to the, the, the chair of uh, agriculture in Kentucky and Colorado, they were saying, man, if we had to do it all over again, we'd do it differently. And I brought this up with uh, John at, uh, from Ananda the other night at, uh, in Kihei when he spoke. And he was saying there's kind of like Dodge City. If anybody, if any of the leaders here from Colorado and that are sponsoring this convention, if they can speak to that, that would be great. Because there seems to be some, um, you know, like any man that builds up something, there's always another man to tear it down or to bastardize it or, you know, to change it to where it's not Pono, you know. And so I, I don't think it's necessarily the governor blocking as more or less a thing what's in the best interest of Hawaii at this point in time. Am I wrong, or what is your uh, point? My perception of in working with Scott and DOA is that, uh, you know, he's been supportive. And he's, uh, the fact that we are where we are has been helpful, and the governor has been supportive. He's going to continue. Um, as far as the uh, having the permitting done, I mean, having the licenses distributed to farmers by the end of the year, I plan to bird dog this, and I plan to talk to Scott and make sure. He didn't sign it in blood when he told me, but I want to make sure that this happens, that it's not just another one of these things, and then, oh, they come up with another excuse, and it's not going to happen. So, but uh, the fact that he's um, proclaimed at the World Conservation Congress in September that he wanted to double our local fruit production, um, words mean things. And so I think he understands that. He's been criticized for having a, a different kind of uh, leadership skills in terms of you know, he's an engineer, kind of a low-key guy. But uh, in my experience in talking with him and dealing with Scott, uh, it's been a good experience. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Russell, Thank you. Aloha. I'm 
Russell Rudin, I'm also a state senator. Our district uh, is just outside of town here and includes all of Puna and Ka'u. Um, it's very exciting for me to, to have this hemp, hemp conference and it's especially uh, fortuitous and I appreciate that it's here in Hilo. I don't know if I'd be able to attend it otherwise and I, I, I do have a vision for the Big Island as an agricultural leader in our state. So it's, I really want to thank the people who put this on, the folks from Colorado as well as the local team. And I'm, I'm always excited when I'm in a room full of people who are really changing the world, you know? It reminds me of a famous thing by Margaret Mead, I think, that never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And you know, I think we're, we're seeing that here. Um, we all know about the importance of hemp for our environment, for our health and stuff. And you don't need me to tell you that. I do wear a second hat besides the state, besides being a state senator. I wear a third, but the second one's relevant. The second one is I'll, I own a group of natural food stores on the island, as Vincent said, and we sell plenty of hemp products, as does any natural food store in, in the country these days. We sell both the CBD oils and the you know protein powders and various. Uh, hemp containing body care products that are that are very exciting new products and uh, it's not just a uh, it's not just a fad it's a trend um, and I from my position as a retailer in Hawaii I can say that there's a tremendous demand for these products and there's a tremendous demand for locally grown and locally made products so when do we get to the point where we can grow and manufacture various hemp products from hemp grown and made in Hawaii, it will command a very strong uh, price. A very, there'll be a very strong demand for it, both here in Hawaii and elsewhere. Really, one of the ways that Hawaii can compete in the world and be financially successful is to focus on a certain strength that we have, our brand, if you will, that people think of Hawaiian products as the best ultimate, they can't get any better, they're organic, they're clean, they're healthful. That's the image people have of our products. And we ought to protect that image, but we also can benefit from having that image because it's these sorts of things, things that are related to health, things that are related to super high quality, things that are a little bit expensive. That's the kind of the place where Hawaii can really thrive. We're not gonna grow rice cheaper than anybody else. We're gonna grow gourmet products better than anyone else. So it, it really fits in. And you know, when I have something that's made in Hawaii, it, it doesn't just command a 20% differential. It, I can sell it for twice as much. If it's, if it's a good product and got a good story behind it and it's quality, people will pay twice as much for it. That's the kind of people that are seeking out hemp products and the kind of people that will pay more for local foods. So I'm just here to say that the market will be here for us when we start developing products. I have a concern, and one of my big concerns right now is this idea of what's going to happen with our seed program and whether the DEA is going to uh, register us for a seed program. And there's, we've heard about this, and it's been a, a hot topic for me these last couple of weeks since I first learned uh, from Greg that he that it was possibly under threat. And we'll be working on that. I'm trying to make sure. I'm planning to have a meeting with, uh, with, with a few folks to try to hash it out, whether we're taking a stand that we need, to, whether, we're being, uh, whether, we're, whether we're being overly cautious or not. I have a couple of legal advisors that feel differently than what our state uh, agencies feel right now, and I'll try to reconcile that, I hope. A part of that is this big interpretation of a gray area, this gray area of the, the, the discrepancy between federal law and, and state rights. And so there is a gray area, but I think it's important, and currently we are being, you know, somewhat cautious in addressing that gray area, taking a very cautious approach, which I fully understand. It's a, it's a, it's a reasonable approach to take. Um, but there is also a place for being bold. You know, sometimes we have to not be timid and not be cautious, and we have to be bold. And the question is, who are we siding with? Are we siding with the DEA? who has an opinion that maybe we need their registration, which is a questionable opinion that other states have apparently proven is not quite true. Or do we side with our farmers and our people and our economy who need us to be a little bit bold and perhaps push on this a little bit? 
So be very interested to see what happens in the next couple of weeks. But if the DEA registration doesn't come through, I will be working with our direct, Chair Enright and others and really trying to push, as well as the governor, to try to encourage them to be bold and to take a stand for our state and our farmers and our health. And the, 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 perhaps that's more important than the DEA's opinion. I understand that we need to respect all those opinions and, and be cautious. Um, a couple of things that we can do about this situation. I think we can all tell our state representatives and our people at the head of, you know, the, the governor and the head of the Department of Agriculture how important it is to us. We can we can communicate to that to them in a respectful way, and I think it will matter. And I think that it'd be important to learn more about the law. There's quite a bit of information on the Department of Agriculture website, and I think we need if we don't already have one, forgive me, something like a Hawaii Hemp Advisory Group, some some organization that can be our voice because I think Mike will acknowledge when we see testimony in the, in the legislature it's divided into three categories government agencies organizations individuals the organization testimony carries extra weight it looks more legitimate and it's very easy to do you don't have to do anything special to, to have an organization and I, I encourage us to do that I wanted to talk very briefly, you know, um, a lot of people think hemp is illegal because it's, ac it's accidentally illegal because it's associated with marijuana, it's genetically associated with it. Whereas I think as a good case can be made, it's the other way around. Marijuana was, was the poster child and the reason for cannabis, you know, the, the selling point, but the motivation for making cannabis illegal was the tremendous economic potential of hemp and the threat that that posed to our timber industries and our oil industries. And it's... <laughs> so we've kind of come full circle. And, you know, we're at a point, at least I feel, where our planet, our Earth, doesn't have a lot of time to spare. We don't have a lot of time to fool around with the things that will help us with our major problems. And so for my, myself, I have a sense of urgency. You know, we've heard today about the urgency for farmers who are invested in this process, the ur urgency based on economics, etc. I have a good friend uh, from Kauai named Gary Hooser, some of you know him. He, he has a phrase that I like, he says, I'm too old for incremental change and a study group. <laughs> and you know in politics we like to do that. Let's just do a little bit. Let's just let's study it and come back in a couple years. It's very tempting, you know, it's always tempting to do that. Uh, but what I would change about that statement is it's not, yes, I'm too old for incremental change and uh, study groups, but the planet is in a situation where it does not have the time for incremental change and study groups. And we need to be bold, we need to take action to help our society and our planet now. That's why I'm so excited about things like what's happening in this room uh, and, and, and the entire uh, hemp industry. You know, it's it's really is up to us to save the planet. I think we've seen that it's going to be a do-it-yourself job, and we need to step up to the plate. And I'm so excited by what all of you folks are doing. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, and, and just to clarify, to clarify something too, and with all due respect to Senator Ruderman, <coughs> a Hawaiian elder once said to me, "Huh, Earth Day, kind of funny, yeah." Man thinks we need to save the earth. More better he save himself because the earth will do just fine without us. You know? right. And uh, but I think that's what he's talking. That Senator Ruder is talking about is that you know, life as we know it is in, in dire. We're in dire straits right now, and in the spirit of how we're there's only four places on this planet. Think about this. There's only four places on this planet that stores carbon. Okay, that's in the sky, in the ocean, in the soil, and in plants. So at breakneck speed right now, we're storing it in the sky and in the oceans. We're acidifying our oceans, our skies, melting our, our polar caps, whereas we can start storing an amazing amount of carbon in the soil with roots, just like when the buffalo roamed, and the buffalo would eat the proteinaceous tops off of the, off of the grasses, and they would do to and shishi and move on to the next tops, and they would build human rich soils that when king corn came in they said they could hear the roots being 
pulled up from miles away to the sound of the roof being ripped up. So, you know, that's where the carbon can be stored. That's where we can truly, you know, put, get some traction around climate change. Um, in that spirit, there's, in this hemp legislation piece that we're talking about, um, and that these gentlemen have been working so diligently at, I think there needs to be some finishing up, we have a few minutes left, to what would you recommend, because you work with your colleagues. I know you said showing up, organizations actually showing up makes a big difference, and Hawaii Farmers Union's a voice at the legislature. The more members we got, you know, it's gonna make the, the, that much more of an of impact. But what would you suggest we do with your colleagues um, in, in coming to the legislature? Do we bring them um, hemp lunches? Do we, you know, I mean, do, do they have an experiential, do you, you know, as part of your experience is going on to the farms, do we set up farm tours for your, for your co colleagues? When would we do that? When would be a good time for us to gather them together to actually have a physical experience of being on a farm? Um, to see some of these things that we're talking about here today. What would, what would be some of the things you would recommend? Well, all of the above, basically. Because we're, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about relationships. So if you bring a little gift, you know, a little hemp bar or something like that, of course, you know, or, or you, um, uh, the informational briefings that we have at the Capitol where they're not well attended sometimes, but again, it depends on how well you get the word out. Even if staffers show up and the legislator does not show up, that's a good sign because the staffer has to report back to the boss and the, the information gets passed on. But uh, yeah, so anything along those lines. The staffers will, are very important. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So building relationship with the staffers helps communicate to them. Yes. And also the, the, the site visits, I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, that's, you know, I uh, invite my committee members uh, often to come out and when, they, when their schedules permit, they come out and, and we talk about it after and they say, wow, I had no idea, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's super important. Thanks, thanks for that question, Vincent. Um, I would add um, that, you know, different legislators, just like people in general, respond to different concerns. So the trouble is, inviting someone to a farm tour or to a film is usually you get the choir there and you're preaching to the choir. People that aren't interested in that subject aren't going to be there. So um, it's useful, but it, we also need to find ways to reach those other folks that don't have the same interest. And for me, I, I, you know, I was talking to, forgive me, I can't remember his name, one of the gentlemen that's so important in the Colorado industry was telling me they created 30,000 jobs and I got 150 million in tax last year. That, that's the kind of thing that will reach a legislator who doesn't care about the environment or CBD oils and stuff like that. So, you know, we, we need to reach those guys too. And I think that emphasizing some of those benefits, you know, speaking in their language, it is important to get to know them, and to, you know, talk to them, call them repeatedly, respectfully. But um, talk in their language. If, if they tune out when you talk about the environment, then find something else. Maybe they care about tax money, or maybe they care about jobs in their district. And uh, th we need those folks to get convinced also. Great. Thank you very much. Know who you're speaking to. Yeah. So um, there's a saying that goes like this. If we're not at the table, we're part of the menu. <laughs> so we have, um, um, we, we are at the table. And we're in relationship with the folks that are making decisions. And I hope you put your trust in us and the trust in these gentlemen to continue to know that they're working towards a, a future for us that truly is about the best and highest interest of people. So is there any questions? Is there a few questions your senators? Yeah, dear. Here, here, here's the mic. Greg, right, you're next. Hello, my name is Natak. Um, I've been lived on this island for about 30 years. I've been a cannabis aficionado for about 50 years. So I've been an activist for that long too. So I, and when Jacksonville came out in 85 and I was enthralled, I was doing presentations. I was so excited about him. 
And I was connected with the Hawaiian Hemp Company. Roger and Dwight started back in Pahoa, which incidentally was the first retail hemp company in the United States of America, <laughs> yay Pahoa. Yeah. And, um, and your question for Yes, I have a question. I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I, I'm okay. used to these three minute things, but I do definitely have a question. I'm trying to create a basket for who I am and why I'm asking this question. In the 90s, um, went to a lot of council meetings, of course, and, and contributed in that way. Uh, one phrase, one hyphen and word came to us, cross-pollination. As soon as cross-pollination came into it, we all kind of went, whoa. There are a lot of people, myself included, who are dependent upon growing our own medical marijuana. We are very, very concerned about cross-pollination. I know that NPR, Tim was telling me that for the past week there's been a, a conversation on NPR with a lot of people saying, oh, it's a myth, it's not true. But of course it's true. Anybody who's in agriculture knows, that, knows there's a possibility of cross-pollination. Otherwise, why is there the problem with, with uh, Monsanto and the farmers next door to them? So I just want to know with you, are you taking us into consideration? Is there anything that you can conceive of or that you can, are, are willing to do to help us so that we can continue growing? Can you create safe areas? Is it even a thought? And I'm addressing everyone in this room, and I know this is perhaps the gorilla in the room that shouldn't have been brought up at this conference. I believe in hemp. I've always believed in hemp. But I'm also very concerned about the possibility that our medical marijuana thing is going to be taken away from the patients and turn completely over to the dispensary. So instead of me spending maybe $45 an ounce to grow it, I'm going to have to spend $350 to buy it. And that's my statement. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to try to ask that, please. please. Uh, now, Tech, regarding the last thing you said, one of the, in, the, in this year's medical marijuana omnibus bill, we extended the caregiver provision and the grow it yourself provision for five years and in fact expanded it, yep. which is the biggest concern that I hear from my district when I go out regarding what we got wrong with the medical marijuana law. And you know, I represent Pune district and I've lived in Pune for 30 years. So I'm a little bit familiar with this phenomenon. Um, <laughs> I do not personally believe that we're going to see a problem with cross contamination. I know, Russell, I okay, so let me try to explain why. The hemp farms are going to be few and far between. First, they've got to get a license, they've got to be legitimate uh, in acting in commercial activities. They're not going to be your next door neighbors. They're not going to be down the street from you. They're going to be 20 miles away, 30 miles away, 5 miles away. Um, it, it's my understanding that pollen, cannabis pollen, doesn't in reality drift in the kind of real life situations that we have at Puna more than 100 or 200 yards. And if there's the occasional single pollen that drifts for a mile, that's really not a problem. That's not going to contaminate anybody's problem. So yes, that is a concern. Medical marijuana and recreational marijuana are a big concern of mine and my communities, and I would never want to do anything to ruin them. And I do not believe that our experimentation with hemp poses any threat to that. If I did, I would uh, be trying to address it. I think we're a decade away from having hemp farms uh, common enough for it to be a uh, contamination problem for marijuana. That's my belief. It's, I have a degree in botany. I have a little experience in Puna, and that's what I think is the reality of it. And I don't have enough concern for that to say, hold it. Let's not push forward as strongly as we can with this crop we can save for the world. So I think we can both, uh, both things can exist. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Smith had a question. Can I, can I give him a question? Okay, great. Please come here. I can just yell. Yeah, um, yell. Uh, um, you brought up the subject, uh, sort of the catch-22 question, um, which was uh, that you won't have the money to have an inspector. So if you don't have an inspector, how can you give out permits? Because we can't do it without the money. Right? What I did, and thanks for bringing it up, Rick. Uh, DOE has said that they have, they will be coming up with the funding for the inspector. Although it wasn't included in the budget, they said they're they're going to use some creative solutions to make sure that the inspector's taken care of. 
And my understanding is going to be Clouseau. So, <laughs> okay. And thank you very much, ladies and Let the record note that both Senator Ruderman and I are wearing Aloha Hem shirts today. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Uh, you have a uh, just a comment. A model that has been adopted in Colorado, for example, um, as far as our hemp seed uh, crossing with our medicinal crop, uh, one of the models that they're doing in Colorado is having certain counties or districts grow just hemp, okay. or they just grow CBD, or they just grow medicine in different areas. So there may be uh, a time where the Big Island is famous for its seed and Maui is famous for its hemp fiber, and Kauai is famous for its terpenes or something like that. So we have different branding, different crops, and it's all the same crop, but it's not necessarily in contamination with our medicinal crop. So it is very clear that they can't coexist or aren't already doing it, and they're cooperating together, right? Working together. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to Senator Christie of our C-Senator. And um, remember, hemp is medicinal, too, folks. <laughs>